Hello everyone, today I would like to make an introductory video about the Hellenistic world. Um, this is thought ori originally um, as um, an introduction to the, um, the basis of um, European civilization for, um, for medieval history, essentially. So it, it's very, um, it's not really an introduction to the Hellenistic um, history proper, but rather an outlook um, relative to the Hellenistic kingdoms and their uh, society and, and culture broadly meant. Um, so let's stick to even the original purpose and try to, to really understand what the Hellenistic world was and, um <coughs> and what were the major characteristics that were uh, eventually inherited by medieval civilizations, not just the, um, the Western one, but also the, um, dependently what you mean by Western, even the Byzantine one, which is still Western in my opinion, but also the Arab civilizations and those which followed. Uh, just yesterday I was incidentally talking about how um, both the Byzantine Empire and the um, Arab Caliphate um, uh, drew uh, very heavily from uh, the Hellenistic world in terms of culture, etc. And, and w they can be conceived even in a certain historical dimension how uh, the last hairs of the, uh, the Hellenistic world. And I don't mean the ancient world, but properly the Hellenistic one because the characteristics that will be seen here uh, largely survived in Tudor's world as heirs of, um, uh, especially of the Roman Empire that had basically mm, um, uh, in mm, included and um, probably the, the most um, florid part of the Hellenistic um, areas that were incidentally also some of the uh, wealthiest one um, of the ancient world um, in Eurasia. So, uh, first of all, talking about the Hellenistic kingdoms, we have to point out that their um, uh, the, the prevalent culture, the hegemonic culture present in the Hellenistic kingdoms was the Greek one. So from one side we have essentially a linguistical influence from Greece, uh, when we talk about the Hellenistic world, we're talking about, in fact, something that came from, uh, not a, that is not Hellenic, but Hellenistic, that is essentially the um, development and the um, re-elaboration of the um, Hellenic models of the Greek classical uh, age. And on the other side, however, uh, since the Hellenistic world was created by the Greeks, but into um, a very different um, ethnic uh, space from the Greek motherland. Uh, Hellenistic civilization has also another very important characteristic, that is the religious syncretisms between the Hellenistic cults and those of the eastern areas that um, the Greeks had conquered. Um, <coughs> first of all, when we talk about the Hellenistic um, kingdoms, we usually think it was, you know, um, it was a mainly uh, Greek-influenced uh, world, but telling the truth, and especially from a political uh, and military point of view, um, there is a distinction that has to be made within the same Hellenic world, um, that is the one of the, um, the distinction between the Greeks and the Macedons. Um, the Greeks had definitely been the um, culturally leading uh, um, ethnicity uh, for the development of, <laughs> in fact, of Hellenic culture. But at the time of the, um, the creation, let's say, of the Hellenistic um, world, uh, definitely those who managed to export the Greek models abroad and, and creating uh, kingdoms and empires uh, based on, on Greek cultures, uh, culture were the Macedons, who weren't exactly Hellenic in the, in the full sense of, of the word, in the sense that at the time they spoke essentially Greek, but they were considered by the Greeks uh, something re relatively different from them, uh, kind of borderline between um, uh, Hellenism and, 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 and barbarity <laughs> in some fashion, considered that the Greeks of um, 
uh, Attica and uh, um, Peloponnesus um, looked uh, suspiciously, let's say, even you know the northern Greeks of of Beotia, for instance, or Aetolia, because they considered them already kind of um, influenced by the the non-Greek, the non-Hellenic uh, peoples of the north. So the Macedons were pass beyond that day between Athens and 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 and, and the uh, Macedonian capital Pella there was uh Thebes uh the Thessalians who were also quite borderline and and eventually there was the, the Macedonian kingdom that had however um risen as a major and as a leading um political and military power in the southern Balkans in the Hellenic peninsula um and that had been heavily, however, uh, Hellenized by that time. Uh, but even the same Macedonians, uh, ethnically speaking, were um, were seemingly of different origins. They were essentially Illyrian, Thraco-Illyrian, uh, largely in their origin. Also partly Hellenic, but that was probably a minority. And even if the elites had been Hellenized, they still were, um, you know, a very different society from the Greek one. Um, the Hellenic uh, society had developed the um, idea of the city-state, uh, which now in truth is not really an Hellenic model, meaning that in indeed the Greek polis were, um, you know, a, a very unique thing all over the world, but the concept of the city-state was um, um, a Near Eastern uh, borrowing in many ways. You can consider the same thing also for the Etruscans or Rome. Um, 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 and, um, and, and the uh, Greeks had developed uh, in this sense a very different um, mindset that in fact informed the what we call we t today we tend to say that essentially the Western identity starts, especially Western thought, and I completely agree on on the thought, um, <coughs> the uh, the Western tradition, hmm? because indeed the Greeks managed to do something in philosophical and then um, in terms of political theory, um, and also of of of, of social, political, and even and even military organization. The idea of the mm, uh, peasant um, uh, soldier that that is also citizen of the polis, etc. Uh, the Macedonians um, and and obviously the Greeks um, before the, the Hellenistic era had been uh, hugely influent all over the peoples that they uh, they entered in contact with. Also because the Greeks uh, the Greeks, as you know, expanded quite quite a lot into the Mediterranean. They founded um, a lot of um, of cities didn't really go um, so deep in um, Hellenizing in the political and social m um, models the, the populations that they um, that they met because this is actually a myth that there was really nothing alike uh, the Hellenistic polis not even you can argue that even the Greek colonies founded abroad were quite a different thing from the ones of the of the Hellenic motherland but let's say, generally speaking, that in many ways, and especially in cultural terms, so um, elements that can be even considered as superficial, they had strongly Hellenized based areas o of the world at that time. Uh, so that we can talk about, I don't know, um, Partoelens, uh, Lens, or Shitoelens, or um, um, Libo Lens, or um, Celto Lens, you know. Um, um, think about even the, <coughs> the the colonies in southern Italy and all this stuff. So the Greeks were literally everywhere in many ways, but they kind of remained um, in their city-states sort of monads compared to the rest of the civilizations. Um, in the sense that um, a people like the Macedonian one uh, was strongly um, Hellenized in surface, but had very different uh, very different political and social organization compared to the Greek polis. The Greek polis were, uh, as we said, democratic city-states. Uh, the Macedonian kingdom was, um, as a matter of fact, a feudal kingdom in many ways. Feudal because, especially, obviously it wasn't at the levels of you know what, what we see in, in Western Europe uh, in, in the low Middle Ages as feudal society, 
uh, from a quantitative point of view. Um, the uh, Macedonian aristocracy was much poorer in comparison to the French one of the 13th century. But I it's, it's really the model that counts here. It's the idea that there, were, there was an aristocracy that owned a, lo a freaking lot of land for those time standards and lived uh, off of these by forming a professional um, a military class that incidentally developed also, like in all feudal societies, a strong, a very strong cavalry, Macedonian cavalry being famous uh, in, in the ancient world, and similar was to, to other uh, peoples that inhabited in the, in the surroundings, especially the Thessalians, um, that were prized for their cavalry. But w w <laughs> I always kind of digress on military details, but what I want to stress now is that the Macedonians had um, 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 a political system that eventually into the Hellenistic age was um, conjugate and um, combined, better saying, to the Hellenic culture and exported, therefore, as a culturally Hellenic m a model, but a, a p uh, um, social political uh, and even military Macedonian model. So, what you find uh, in um, as other characteristics of the Hellenistic uh, kingdoms and empires um, was the uh, creation of military colonies that were of different origin, um, ethnically speaking, because the model was Macedonian. Um, because the Greeks uh, didn't really have any professional military at this point, just Sparta, but Sparta was kind of an exception and it was also diff very different from the Macedonian model. Um, <coughs> but what the Macedons uh, needed was uh, a fresh, um, you know, a, a class that could support a professional army. Uh, that could be called and, and scattered even as a military presence, like a bit like the Romans did at a point, all over the, the empire, throughout colonies of therefore um, professional soldiers that however worked as farmers, lived as farmers into these colonies, they were scattered all over the empire. So as I was saying, uh, even as um, they were also conceived as military garrisons at this point. But to this new model also participated not just people coming from Macedonia, but also um, Greeks coming from the, um, <coughs> the proper Hellenic world that uh, by this time is in a sort of crisis um, from the classical model of the polis, also because the Macedonians had basically uh, made the Greek powers uh, client states after having defeated uh, some of them and having therefore extended their hegemony over the um, the southern um, the southern Balkans. Um, the um, the reason why this net of military colonies uh, was there is it's that the Macedonians had also developed um, um, a, a very unique thing in, in military history that was the Macedonian phalanx, about which, telling the truth, we don't know that much. I will surely talk about the Macedonian phalanx in one day. I know it's a hov overly debated um, and hotly debated topic, but sometimes I think people don't get um, things right about it. Um, and, but what is fascinating is that the phalanx has one characteristic. It has to work with uh, a great number of men. It's not an elite of troops. You need, in order to make phalanx work, you need really a lot of 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 um, of, of pike mass, of body mass, in many ways. So um, um, this is the reason why these military colonies were so, you know, many and and scattered all, all over the empire. Um, but in parallel to these, um, the the Hellenistic kingdoms um, um, learned. Since an early age, even the same uh, original Macedonian kingdom, when Alexander had still not conquered the Persian Empire, um, had learned to rely on mercenaries. Hmm? The idea that you basically have this phalanx of pikemen and then all the supporting troops are essentially hired from as mercenaries or called up as from from um, allied kingdoms or tribes. So <coughs> you can understand in, in this sense how um, paradoxically the same um, um, culture, Hellenic cultural hegemony was um, uh, accompanied by um, a very multi-ethnic um, um, syncretism.
with other cultures. And the obvious reason was that when the Macedonians invaded um, the Near and Middle East, obviously uh, they, uh, they were um, a very strong minority within the, the, U the very big masses of the Semitic or Persian peoples that inhabited there. Um, and even though the word Greeks actually scattered, especially along the coasts of Anatolia and of the 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 rest of the population was uh, extremely different from a cultural point of view um, to the uh, uh, to the Hellenized Macedonians. So um, and and yet, telling the truth, um, the Greeks had uh, since centuries interacted with these populations. So it's not that uh, the Syrians or or the Egyptians didn't know the Greeks or didn't know Greek culture. Uh, think about the Persian Wars and <laughs> how the Persians knew very well the Greeks, even though they considered them as, you know, barbarians living into the most remote uh, corners of, uh, of the world. And against which, however, they lost the Persian Wars, so... And that's even more meaningful and thought-provoking um, in many ways. Um, but what I hear um, to to stress in here is that there was the imposition um, on these populations of of a new, um, on a relatively new, and syncretic once again um, um, political and military model that was um, in turn based on the ideology of the uh, victorious uh, military leader that had won over this huge uh, amount of peoples uh, that made up from the Greek perspective and also from the perspective of the same peoples most of the times the entire world because Alexander the Great had objectively from the Greek knowledge of his times conquered the whole world they obviously they knew that beyond Indus there was something more but they uh, think about even the geographical knowledge of those times it was actually pretty advanced in the Greek world um, as well as in, in other ones, but uh, um, overall was still pretty scarce uh, in absolute terms. So conquering um, an empire like the, uh, the one of Alexander that stretched from uh, Epirus to, to India was, uh, was in, in the perspective of those people really having achieved uh, not a, a human enterprise, but a rather divine one. And in fact, the ideology that um, surrounds the idea of the um, Hellenistic imperial models is not just the um, truly Western European concept of the warrior that the Macedonians had, telling the truth, that conquered for his personal and human um, abilities and prowess. Um, the world, but because um, the uh, the gods had supported him, and not just support because theoretically also the, the warrior chief was supported by gods in many in, in victories and um, uh, military victories. But uh, um, at this point, the, the meaning was greater because this was not just uh, a warrior chief conquering, um, you know, another tribe. This was uh, a king conquering the whole world, so the gods that had placed him there were kind of, you know, um, even allowing him to, to, to rise at the level of one of theirs. Um, <coughs> and this was um, a really um, um, also heavily mixed, um, and once again, um, a, a re um, the result of a syncretism with the local, local beliefs. Because differently from the uh, Hellenic world, uh, the Egyptian and, and Mesopotamian and Persian world ha worlds had already, um, different from the Greeks, I stress this once again, um, the idea that their kings were practically gods um, uh, on earth. So in, in this syncretism, you, you don't have to think that everything went smoothly in the sense that the um, the actual um, uh, there was a lot. For instance, during um, 
um, w within the um, Macedonian generals of Alexander the Great, obviously this concept wasn't very much liked because um, these um, Macedonian ar aristocrats had a very relatively egalitarian um, concept of nobility for which the king was just one of them that was put uh, in charge because of his human military capabilities but it was essentially part of the same uh, of the same band it was also in Macedonian in perspective the idea that um, a single lineage could be mixed or backed by a divine um, you know sparkle in many ways but what Alexander tried to push at that point on the conquered uh, population and 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 this is really the jarring point he became even to ask to his own Macedonian generals was that he was a god himself which obviously um, was was something never fully accepted probably in, in the Hellenistic world from the Western um, um, perspective of these guys coming in the East from, from a Western background and, and participating to Hellenistic culture but again, syncretism kind of worked on that because the Hellenistic world at a certain point was um, was conquered by the Romans, so at a certain point these people wouldn't even be there anymore. Many had intermarried with the local population and been diluted into this. So the result was something very, uh, very different. And generally speaking, uh, when you see these um, Hellenistic monarchs, even shortly before the the Roman conquest, what you see is that there were um, 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 certain ideals, certain conceptions like uh, and and especially attributes that were tributed to these uh, attributed to these um, um, kings that were um, you know the for instance the, the title of pacifier of savior of peoples um, of, mm, these kings were considered as wise as uh, as um, um, mm, philanthropic and um, and um, and just uh, even from from for it really meant um, it's something that goes really more than the rational dimension on it but that kind of mixed with the um, um, uh, um, characteristics of certain uh, of certain divinity of certain deities that made up the pantheon of especially of the local of the local population so um the um uh, the and, uh, and at this point you f what you find quite often is that um in in the hellenistic kingdoms the presence of um um, um of, of 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 greek names to designate um especially uh, accompanied by a sort of surname uh like zeus soter for instance which means um zeus the um uh, the savior, um, and uh, and that were essentially the um, they represent the implantation of um, Greek deities from the Hellenic world um, into the um, um, into a world that kind of believed these gods to be um, essentially um, their own um, or or better overlapping with with local deities that already existed and had had obviously slightly different or even sometimes consistently consistently different um, characteristics than the the Greek uh, models the Greek gods that had been imported so the syncretism here is it's quite evident and this is something telling truth that also the Romans did when they went uh, west you know sometimes the, the Romans would call as Mercury or Mars certain Gallic deities that uh, were were conceived as such by the Romans because they they had some some similarity to the prerogatives of those particular gods, but that were that had other um, other characteristics, telling the truth, and um, um, and were um, there, however integrated without too many problems. This is how. Um, um, 
and the, the, the whole process went. In fact, the Hellenistic kingdoms was, were usually also quite tolerant, and they, and the Hellenistic monarchs obviously tried to extend as much as possible their um, their uh, divine models to um, to various peoples as a kind of um, a, a unifying um, mean um, to to keep together all these um, various. Um, and, and very different communities in many ways. Obviously, in fr especially in front of the local, um, the, the Hellenistic kings uh, from, from the West kind of um, tried to stress their, um, their sacral origin. Mm? And, um, and together with it, they, they obviously were conceiving of um, setting roots into those kingdoms, so it wasn't like, you know, I come back to Greece now and then, but now I create a kingdom wherever I am, in Egypt, in, in Syria, in, um, uh, even in, uh, in uh, even m far east in some occasions, also because the Hellenistic kingdoms uh, were difficult to keep together. There were many satraps um, that were, it was initially the, 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 in the, per the name for the Persian administrators of the Achaemenid Empire that that were Westerners at this point, placed by the new invaders that kind of rebelled. For instance, Bactria uh, was created as a new kingdom, as a rebel satrapy of the uh, of the Seleucid kingdom. So, um, however, what this implied uh, is that the new dynasties had to have uh, solid roots, and this implied the creation, or better, the um, the exploitation of the uh, of local. Um, um, bureaucracies that already existed to own truth because the Near and Middle East had been the cradle together with India and China and Egypt um, of um, a very you know the early uh, civilizations that were uh, based in cities and that immediately especially relatively to the um, the uh, the polytheistic cults that were um, were born in here um, were associated to the the temples uh, and, and the temples keepers and, and of the sacerdotal uh, class. So there were a lot of functionaries, of people who could write things down, of priests, uh, etc. So that all made up um, a very big apparatus that Tongatrit consumed a lot of resources, but these resources were available and were largely, you know, um, balanced in, in, in that fashion since, um, you know, several, <laughs> you know, millennia uh, in that way, um, in the local uh, regions conquered by the Macedonians. Um, and uh, there was, I was saying, a lot of um, religious freedom, but also a general mm, tolerance towards um, every kind of diversity into the Hellenistic Kingdom, which hasn't to be stressed with, um, it hasn't to be an identified with the um, uh, with the concept of tolerance that we have as moners, that is something deriving essentially and uh, from, from a, and, and especially from a religious point of view uh, from our Western 17th century. Here tolerance means that basically everybody, uh, it didn't matter wherever you came from, what, what language you, you, you spoke, um, what you looked like, you were still fit to be a subject <laughs> essentially and, um, and, and, and everybody was content as, as long as, you know, um, civil um, order was was uh, was okay and uh, um, and, and uh, people paid taxes and trade uh, functions stuff like that this is what tolerance stems from <laughs> usually most of the times um, in history so um, the um, mm, at the same time where there were also Greek polis existing within the borders of these Hellenistic kingdoms were um, so, in this sense, even the same Greeks were part of this privileged, uh, I can't say privileged now, but because it's wrong, but th of, of, of subjects that could, however, retain their own autonomy, and as long as they were faithful and contributed with money to the, to the military campaigns of the Hellenistic kings, everything was, was really fine. And these cities that uh, sometimes were of Greek origin, sometimes were 
something more ancient, uh, were destined to become essentially the base of Hellenistic civilization uh, in many ways. And we're talking about um, most of the time modest centers. Um, Alexander the Great founded um, I don't I don't remember how many like twelve different uh, Alexandria all over the um, the uh, his empire that uh, eventually became some of the most important cities of the world or even d during the Middle Ages. Merv, for instance, was um, um, the old Antiochia in um, uh, Marjana that was. Uh, one of the old Alexandrias, um, and and before the, the Mongols exterminated uh, the population, was the largest city in the world by the 13th century. So think how long and far, and and on how many, how solid were the bases on, on on which these cities were were founded, and in fact there was the development uh, among the various cities of very big metropolis. Um, the most famous being. Uh, Alexandria in Egypt, Antioch, uh, Antioch in Syria, Pergamon in Anatolia, obviously mm, cities um, in the Balkans like uh, Corinth or or Athens or or um, or Pella were extremely important. Then Ro think about Rhodes, um, you know, there were many important centers, um, <coughs> uh, mostly of Greek origin, but also of a more ancient. Um, tradition, think of Babylon mm, or Susa, so, so great centers since a very early age. Um, so um, how could this system really work? But from, from a political point of view, the, the thing was very simple. Uh, these peoples were, uh, the, the population of these ki the Hellenistic kingdoms was mostly made up of uh, subjects, uh, were not slaves. So there were huge, huge masses of people who worked for those at the top. The average um, landholding system was the latifundium. So these huge estates that basically uh, were owned by the, the local um, aristocracy uh, of Macedonian origin. The word, the word um, seemingly, you know, uh, it, it depends also on the region in the sense that, for instance, uh, for for what I know, Egypt was uh, with the Nile and all had seen the development historically of 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 many middle um, um, middle sized properties scattered all over the um, all over Egypt, and this seemingly caused also um, a greater uh, weakness to the power of the, of the Ptolemaic uh, kingdom of Egypt, because Ptolemy, this is named, you know, it, it takes um, its name from, from the general of Alexander, uh, who had this name and it founded the Ptolemaic dynasty of Egypt, um, caused more political uh, unrest in the sense that um, middle-class people are more resourceful because they have something. They're not people living in, in, in the estates, broken their backs all the day long. Obviously, they don't have an absolutely, um, <laughs> you know, um, happy or or, or um, um, luxurious life, but they they kind of had means to to make a social class of some power t that could even. Um, force the local monarchy to 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 recognize uh, t uh, uh, itself and to 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 enter into uh, a wider political dialectic. Um, other areas were relatively um, different, but let's say that generally speaking, the state, for instance, had an almost uh, complete monopoly over the local industries which al also explains, by the way, um, first of all, how the, the previous uh, governments were already quite centralized, because it's, this is something that the, the Macedonians created uh, from scratch, that it was already uh, basically the, the same uh, apparatus there. Um, and, uh, and obviously there were also an a very efficient tributary system for which taxes could be drawn from these lands. Um, and uh, was there a middle class um, in, in some numbers? Yes, especially living in the cities and especially of being of Hellenic origin, most of the times, but not always. Um, 
and this middle class w wasn't much of a middle class, but it was more. A, it became slowly a sort of an aristocratic class, um, in, in certain occasions. Also because these um, Hellenistic societies were um, were ra rather crystallized, probably at the top. You know, you know those who were at the top were very difficult to take at the bottom. Um, they ruled the whole system and they were expression of the same ruling class. So so they owned land um, and they had cli uh, clients indeed so that this huge quantity of wealth was somehow invested uh, with little through little loans to, to certain groups of people that therefore came to be tied to the, these aristocrats and could be used politically, etc. Like, um, like a bit in, in the Roman world and essentially, you know, um, the world society of every civilization at the time was clientarily in, in, in some measure. Here, there were very large um, groups of clients for a single aristocrat and, and it was a very uh, stratified society um, uh, in many ways. Um, and um, we mm, and and these aristocrats would especially try to monopolize the uh, masses of the cities, um, especially um, making you know th there is a term that is avergetism, that is this idea of you know um, um, spending uh, a lot for the the good of the community and uh, being appreciated as such, but that was more of the ideological side of the matter. We're talking about the formation of, of clientary systems that uh, even had a very kind of um, mobster character, you know. we um, These aristocrats made a hell of a lot of money with subcontracts, um, which they highly um, speculated. Um, and, um, and and they they obviously controlled the trade uh, in many ways. Um, the um, and there were also banks at this point. Um, and you have to understand that this di di um, dynamics uh, really pushed for the creation of a lot of documentary evidence uh, because these things were all written down. These were the places where the writing had. Um, originally being invented, so there was a very long tradition of mm, writing and storing into um, I think about even the libraries, uh, the great library of Alexandria, they were kind of warehouses, it's, it was not a library in the, in the modern sense of the word where people went reading things, they were basically huge st um, storage edges of, 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 of manuscripts that only um, scholars from the court went reading uh, a tiny fraction of the wall, uh, and that um, more or less, instead, rather than than thinking for the use, were really think as as a treasure mm, that had to reflect this um, the the structure of of, of uh, and the universal ambitions of the of the kingdom. So, even the great knowledge that we assume was present in the um, the Hellenistic libraries was. Uh, more of a, s um, I can't say a symbolic thing, but it was more a matter of how it was organized, or maybe the the, the building that was dedicated to store it rather than f for actual access for it um, from the population. Paradoxically, um, the Romans who were a bit rougher than the the Greeks, arguably, um, in proportion, read more than uh, than in what was done in the Hellenistic kingdoms in terms of of sheer numbers of readers. Um, so, uh, but this will, we will be discussing that in another <laughs> um, chapter. But um, the, mm, you have to imagine a highly dynamic world from a cultural point of view. We have to think about, it was a lot of private education, obviously the more those who had more money could really get a better education. Large majority of people wa had a very low um, uh, schooling, um, and there was indeed uh, there were also public schools. Telling the truth, I don't want to, but they were a bit different from, from what we think today. It was maybe uh, aimed to have a kind of m low level but yet acceptable education for carrying out economical business and stuff 
um, there was not the idea of mass scholarization at this point at all. It was a highly pragmatic, um, it was aimed at obtaining highly pragmatic results. And um, there were also the so-called gymnasia, there were places where people went essentially learning but also discussing and making physical activity. Um, and uh, there was also a great cult of aesthetics, you know, think about uh, Greek art, there was uh, also here um, um, uh, syncretized with, with the Eastern one and all these static models that could um, really uh, be uh, be formed at this point. There was a definite and definitely also literary culture because most of these models were in turn deriving from philosophical conceptions of the universe, of the role of mankind, um, and um, uh, there was a great pride f and, uh, and, and, and money spent for the um, civil and religious splendor of the cities in which people lived. Um, so, as I was saying, virgitism really played in this sense uh, sort of, uh, of cycles, so that um, aristocrats spent a lot of money for, for doing this, but getting back a lot of um, fealty from the masses and, uh, and taking revenues from the exercise of many business and, and so on. Um, and, and, and in fact, the, the citizen uh, offices that existed in order to, to, to maintain the city, to administrate the cities, um, were, uh, were, were, uh, were not paid. Essentially, uh, the magistrates were, were doing that for free. And you can understand, <laughs> in turn, how, you know, by making it for free, it couldn't be an investment without um, something in return. So obviously you can imagine the corruption and the the pro the and the private interests um, being all one with the public ones, as a matter of fact. So this is one of the characteristics of the ancient world that what we conceive as public was arguably always instead, you know, private in the, the oligarchies whether it's um, classical Greece or Republican Rome, always were in charge of the situation and could influence the, the political directions. And um, and those were, uh, you know, the classical Greece and Republican Rome were some of the most egalitarian <laughs> societies uh, in the uh, of the Mediterranean. Uh, here, the Hellenistic societies were kind of much more, you know, verticalized, and verticized, and um, you know, much more inegalitarian than than those ones. Um, the um, so yeah, it, w it was all one with with world civilization. You can argue that the Hellenistic world was uh, pretty much. Um, um, it drew from everywhere, you know, whether it was a, a local belief, a philosophical current, an economical interest, all were kind of um, permeated one with the other. And um, this is, I think, an important characteristic of the, uh, of the, uh, entr uh, of the Hellenistic world. Um, the um, uh, was a lot of solemnity, obviously. Um, the, the major the, the more powerful um, people at this point were in the uh, high bureaucracy, so uh, uh, also very few people uh, belonging to very pr privileged uh, classes. Um, the, uh, the, the, the priest classes were class was often hereditary, uh, this dating back quite often to the you know, very ancient times, because local traditions had always been like that. Um, so temples were enormously powerful, you know, temples weren't just um, um, local mm, places of cult, they were, um, they were sometimes even sort of cities within the Dylanistic cities. Um, they had guards, they had money, they had people living in them and working in them. Um, so it was something very big that could even influence the um, the local political life in, in many ways, and was a lot of also of competition between them. That is, you know, maybe you you 
you were a client of a temple of a certain deity that was opposed to the one um, <laughs> of another deity living in another side of town it would be kind of clashes between uh, the clients of these um, sanctuaries to to you know to to gain power over the local businesses and so on. So it's something even very crude. We don't we don't have to idealize the, the Hellenistic world uh, by any standard. And uh, it was really still a very dark, meager um, place to live, um, like most of the times in history. Um, and um, and there were, um, you know, besides the, the 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 powerful guys of the nobility and of the, the priest class, etc., mm, relatively modest uh, classes of artisans, and especially as I was recalling before, huge quantity of of peasants that made up the majority, the wide majority um, of the population. They depended by the tributary system by the temples and the aristocracies at the same time. So they were explo highly exploited. Um, the peasants, especially, you know, the Hellenistic kingdoms were created in some of, of the most fertile areas of the known world at the time. Uh, think about uh, the, the Tigris and the Euphrates <laughs> in Mesopotamia or the Nile in Egypt. These were, you know, the Seleucid Empire and, and the Ptolemaic Kingdom respectively were some of the most powerful um, Hellenistic entities of the, uh, um, of the time. Um, and, uh, and obviously it was slavery. Um, this is, you know, today there is a lot of talk about slavery because of the American history that has kind of made people, I think rightfully, more sensible to the issue. Um, and, uh, and that people sometimes are shocked to remember, like saying, you know, most of the civilizations, oh, basically all the civilization back then um, uh, were, um, were based on slavery. Um, yes, uh, so it was, and our civilization also passed through that, through the, 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 the enslavement of, of literally millions of people that broke their back every single day to deliver us things like the, the pyramids or <laughs> the, the, um, the, the gardens of Babylon or... Well, telling the truth, the, the pyramids seemingly were um, paid by salaried um, specialized um, workers, but let's say that generally speaking, you know, what we see as an accomplishment of, of those civilizations was based on labor force, it was normally usually um, you know slave force because if if the guys who built I don't know the Colosseum maybe they were paid maybe they were freemen but at the same time money that the Romans had found to to to, to build the Colosseum well, came from having conquered I don't know places like Gaul and having enslaved a million people or and and essentially m being uh, able to grow that that resources and in, into such a masterpiece uh, of architecture like the Colosseum is. And we should be mindful of that um, in many ways, because sometimes in history we, we look at certain societies and we say, uh, this is something that happens often, you know, uh, the ancient world was the most advanced, look at the Colosseum, look at the pyramids, um, you know, in the early Middle Ages we didn't, didn't have like anything like that. It, might, it must have been some of, some of the most backwards things in history. Yeah, the Middle Ages may have been poorer than the ancient world. There was also m many less people, but probably some of these people enjoyed a larger freedom, individual freedom, that than, than one in, in, the, in, in the ancient world. And from the ancient world we get all these beautiful things like mosaics and statues and all these highly refined artistical um, uh, works, but we, we should remember that they still came from a highly unequal world and uh, yeah, live with that. You know, I personally it's not probably a, pers a, a problem for me because I don't feel like I'm responsible for that, but I still think that um, it's interesting to to look at things not in an idealized fashion, but for for what it really was, and this is the reason why we study history in um, in the ultimate um, place, I believe. And uh, slavery was definitely fueled by wars, which was the most immediate um, you know source of slave 
slavery, and uh, at least in from a quantitative term, but obviously there were uh, also trade, um, you know, had uh, had a, a share in this also because slaves were, um, however, in turn um, uh, put on the market uh, by mm, raiding warfare of certain maybe minor political entities like tribes that lived at the uh, the borders of these uh, Hellenistic kingdoms that throughout all the Mediterranean and Asia um, you know fought against each other and regularly sold uh, the enemies as slaves to to the more progressed uh, civilization S um, and slavery was um, quite had to be quite even and large in in the cities um, because um, you know every freeman essentially had slaves in his own house um, uh, or at least you know maybe not everyone, really everyone, but considering that soci society was so clienterly, there was someone paying for our people to to live off of slave uh, work. Um, they they were also extensively used in the industries that were kind of mass industries resembling a sort of kind of pre-industrial level of uh, of production. Um, we think that Alexandria in Egypt was made up. Um, in its population by uh, uh, one-third of slaves. Um, but what is fascinating about the um, um, the, the, uh, the Hellenistic um, um, the Hellenistic culture relatively to slavery is that partially uh, slaves and were reckon were recognized uh, with um, a sort of familiar right, and um, even by a very limited even patrimonial right, which means that uh, on the long run a slave could accumulate enough means to eventually buy freedom, which is very beautiful if you think about it, because. Um, um, and it probably correspond. It obviously corresponded, maybe especially to to social and, and more largely anthropological um, logics. But um, um, it probably had also um, a certain ground in the mm, kind of humanistic philosophies that were so widespread in the in the Hellenistic world. So probably was it was a solid structural reason for that, but also a, a, a non indifferent a non indifferent um, ideal reason and uh, cultural reason for uh, these freedoms being granted to to slaves. Um, um, and um, and you can find very um, in fact very quite often mm, free men who sold their slaves in their testament through their testament and um, the, the stoicism for instance basically preached against uh, against slavery mm. um, and, uh, and similarly um, the Epicurean philosophy um, s uh, basically agreed with the thing so um, there was the growing awareness of a sort of um, of um, of human dimension that had to be respected, and sometimes it was something very you know idealistic, even for that world. Even in, in the Roman world, you find that um, uh, you know the 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 great senators like Seneca or, or our great thinkers of the Roman world uh, were um, were kind of expressing such uh, oh such thoughts and um, um, and and essentially recognizing the slaves as, as human beings wi which doesn't have to be for granted right right uh, at this point um, but at the same time it's very it shouldn't be overly stressed um, and idealized because it was still jarring to see aristocrats so highly educated people who expressed this uh, beliefs, while you know they they owned uh, very large estates, where regularly every day there were slaves working for them and dying, and treated in most awful ways. 
Um, but that tells you that civilization t sometimes passes also through cruelty in many ways and that uh, overall such thoughts contributed deeply to the development of, uh, of something greater um, in, our, in our world and that um, without those aristocrats maybe you know we uh, we would think less of human life um, um, and human rights I I in our I in our same day. Uh, they were hypocrites, yes, <laughs> but they they still did good for for that part, um, for for coming out with with the idea at least. Um, and um, uh, <laughs> um, the um, there was also, you know, mm, there's also very um, um, religious sensibility associated to such thoughts, which I would like to um, to, to conclude with this video. Uh, um, you know, you know, in the sense that. Um, All these humanistic um, and anthropocentric beliefs that you find in Hellenistic um, philosophies were extremely important for the creation of Christianism. Now we know obviously that Christianism derives from from Judaism, so uh, we we kind of have the model that from the whole thing stemmed from, and and obviously we can't exclude Judaism. Uh, as the the fundamental mm, starting point of Christianism in many ways, but we we have always to remember that Christianism emerged essentially in an Hellenistic world that was deeply influenced by mm, many and very diverse um, uh, religions that, however, all kind of uh, resembled a bit each other in s for certain. Um, for certain, uh, in certain measure, um, cr we know that Christianity has been heavily influenced by Zoroastrianism, that was a monotheism, um, by Buddhism, <laughs> that has precepts and certain forms of, 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 um, of religious social life that were quite similar to to early monastic uh, Christian monasticism, for instance. Um, um, even the same. Uh, religions, uh, excuse me, the same uh, philosophies that we mentioned before, that is Epicureanism and Stoicism, had been deeply influenced by uh, such beliefs. Um, the Greek world had been, since uh, centuries, in, in, in direct contact with all these Eastern philosophies that literally crossed from China to Europe at this time and, uh, and got mixed um, um, during the way with all, you know, w w with literally everything they found. Um, uh, so, um, and there would be many of these to remember, but uh, let's just say that even the same Judaism was uh, very heavily influenced by the Hellenistic, uh, by the Hellenistic world. Uh, the Jews fought for and, and rebelled successfully against the Seleucid Empire that wanted to impose uh, its religious, um, you know, uh, monarchic models on the, um, on, uh, on, on, the Jew uh, on the Jews and who rebelled and kind of went and, uh, and you know, carried on their fight, uh, not just for political free uh, for religious freedom, but also from, for political independence. So in this sense, even Judaism, the one from which um, Christianity was born, um, independently from you know the, the various sects that made up the and the, the, the Judaic culture of the time, had been in its uh, political reflections, for instance, influenced by the relation with the Hellenistic world and these monarchic models. Um, and this is something we have to be quite mindful of. The Jews, for instance, um, uh, were extremely uh, were scattered basically all over the Near East this time. There were Jewish communities. Uh, telling the truth, al they went also very far, as far as Rome, since the um, at least the second century BC. It's the first time they're documented in Rome, um, and um, and they had learned to live in this Hellenistic world. Um, and there is one element that would strongly characterize, for instance, the um, the Christian uh, thought uh, during the uh, you know from its existence. Now I, I wanted to talk about the relations with the Middle Ages. We didn't do that much, but um, for instance, the struggle for investors, you might say, 
was deeply influenced by the Jewish um, uh, con um, political ideas uh, r relatively to the uh, um, secular powers uh, and the behavior that the believer had to 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 have towards these um, uh, because of you know what the Jews lived like in the uh, in the ancient world being uh, a minority they had always for instance to accept um, they, they were um, kind of advised to to generally accept the local customs the local laws of the various um, kingdoms and uh, peoples they, they came to live in this because obviously they were a minority and they couldn't oppose themselves radically to, to every form of, of different belief and this in turn um, created uh, in the Christian world uh, through the Jewish um, legacy the concept that basically what happens in the heavens follows certain laws that are God's laws but on heart um, uh, left aside that you are a sinner and obviously you can't uh, reach God's perfection but and you should tend to it however you have to be also mindful of the uh, local secular powers because if they are there they're put there by God and therefore you have to 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 respect them in some measure um, um, and this is what uh, this was extremely important for anyone who knows the history of Christianity within the Roman Empire and this even part of the same reason why the, the Christians uh, the Roman Empire eventually became a Christian Empire was based on the um, conjunction and, and coexistence between uh, churchly affairs and um, imperial ones um, that were conceived in relative harmony in practice because of, of this balance that uh, the Jewish uh, legacy had set. And there were really not, these are very complicated topics by the way, I'm simplifying <laughs> horrifully, but uh, the substance I think is important that the Hellenistic world really shaped um, the medieval world and uh, or at least um, you know in great part those who eventually are created the medieval world later um, and it cannot be ignored to uh, even in terms of our uh, contemporary culture um, and, um, and in spite of all uh, a general conclusion can be that the Hellenistic world was um, a very fertile cradle of thoughts, of philosophies, of of different ways of uh, looking at the world, a world that was scientifically um, uh, investigated, uh, obviously not at the levels that, that certain positiv positivistic mind can can imagine in the sense that the supposed scientific progress of the Hellenistic world was something extremely small compared to the um, you know the work uh, of these so-called scientists that most of all were kind of philologists more than else. I mean, it was it was more a, a sort of uh, um, uh, of a proof of, re of erudition than a real um, sometimes a real scientific and mechanical applications. Although the Hellenistic world was definitely extremely advanced, and seemingly there are people who even say that the Romans, at the point by invading this, especially not much uh, the uh, the Hellenistic kings, kingdoms, but certain Greek city-states, kind of hampered uh, the uh, the scientific um, progress and technology of the time. Uh, yes, but probably th the Roman uh, Empire in its uh, statal uh, structures was eventually capable, on the long run, to achieve more, even in terms of absolute, you know, tec number of technologies and developments than these uh, philosophers that lived paid in the courts of the Hellenistic kingdoms. But this is another topic that I maybe will address in another occasion. For now, I hope that you enjoyed this video. Uh, as always, if you liked it, please share it, otherwise leave a like, uh, or subscribe to my channel, which um, I think it's interesting because you can receive, if, if you want, notifications as long as I, uh, every time I make uh, new videos. And as always, I thank you for listening, I wish you a nice time, and see you next time. Bye!